So, Sir Rich, thank you so much for joining us here on AeroTime today. You joined the Royal Air Force in 1988. You've had an astonishing, amazing career ever since then. So tell us about your life in the Royal Air Force and how you came to sign up. Well, it's great to be here, Richard. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me. And I've often get asked, well, how did, how did I end up in the Air Force and you know, what was the moment? And I can't absolutely remember I've always been interested in aviation and aeroplanes. There's a picture of me at a, at a fete in the village in a, in a glider as a sort of seven, eight year old. And I think, the, I think the, the thing that really captured my imagination as, as a boy was actually space. And uh, the space shuttle program was around about that time when I was uh, you know, becoming a, a, a teenager. And I think that really captured my imagination. And so at some point, in my early teens, uh, I knew that uh, I was going to join the Air Force um, as an engineer, partly because by the time I was 12, my eyesight had started to deteriorate. So I knew that I was never going to be a pilot uh, in, in the Air Force. And so around about that time, it, it started to gain currency in my mind. And then I applied for a sick form scholarship when I was 16, mm -hmm. lucky enough to be awarded that. And, and because that was as an engineer, that meant I was definitely going to go to university um, and I had a, a, a sponsored at university as a, as a university cadet and uh, to some extent, as they say, that the, the rest is history. I, I do remember my dad saying uh, when I'd been offered this scholarship, are you, are you sure you want to do this? Uh, because, you know, you're effectively signing up for 16 plus years. And of course, as a, a 16 year old rich went, well, yeah, obviously I want to do this. Um, and from there, went through university, went to initial officer training, did my engineering officer training and then went into the rest of my, my career, which has sort of taken me to here today. So you talk about, you, you, you joined the Air Force as an engineer, you went on to work on some of the most recognisable aircraft, which I know will excite all of the Aerotime viewers, <laughs> uh, Tornado, Harrier, um, Nimrod, yeah. you've, worked, you've worked on them all. So tell us, what's it like working on some of those really amazing aircraft? Yeah, I mean, the thing that when people remind me of that is that all of those things are in museums now and retired from the Air Force, which just kind of make me realise it was a long time ago when I joined. But I've always enjoyed being around aeroplanes. The, um, I, I sometimes joke when you go flying um, at a, an airfield and you have to walk out onto the pan as you're getting onto your 737, I can smell the avatar and it takes me back to my first tour at RAF Kinloss in the early hours of the morning seeing a jet off to go and hunt Russian submarines. And I, I, I find the, 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 the kind of physics and engineering of it just fascinating. And um, there's something about being an engineer, you kind of want to know how things work and uh, want to, to be engaged in, in fixing them. And I've, I've, I still have a, uh, a kind of wonder at aviation and, and the fact that aeroplanes fly and as technology evolves, how they do that more efficiently and more effectively. And being able to work on technology, which at the time um, was really at the leading edge, um, was something I, I, I love doing and love being part of. So you talk about the, the, the miracle and the wonder of aircraft. And I have that same fascination with how these things work. Uh, never more so than a few years ago, as you know, I went flying uh, in a Hawk with 100th Squadron up at RAF Leeming. Um, I think I've just about recovered now, so, uh, so that's good, but it did take a few days, as you know. Um, and it was an amazing experience, and how those, th how those aircraft do what they do, I, I will never know, I'll never understand. Maybe as an engineer you'll explain it to me, but <laughs> tell, us, uh, tell us a bit about the, 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 the amazing flying experiences you've had. Yeah, I've been quite lucky, actually, um, during my career. So I have a, I have a pilot's licence. So I, I, I was... Um, through my sixth form scholarship, was taught to fly and then carried on in the university air squadron and went on to get my, my pilot's license. So I have, I fly Tiger Moths at, at weekends, but in the Air Force I've had the opportunity to fly in uh, the Typhoon. So I've been faster than the speed of sound, which was a particularly special moment. Completely unremarkable when you're inside the cockpit, I have to say. Uh, the other, I've flown Harriers, um, flown in a Hawk. Hovering in a Harrier was a pretty special day as well. So stand, sit, sitting still at 100 feet, a little bit less in a jet is really quite a special experience. Um, and I have to say also one of my favourite opportunities when I got to fly in an F-15E out of Lakenheath uh, a few years ago and that really was quite quite special. Flew over to Wales and did some low level and then came back again. It does make you feel a little bit poorly I have to say and uh, the time it takes to recover I do recognise exactly that but it, it is just a 
fantastic experience to have had um, and gives you renewed respect for, for those who pilot them, actually. It, it's amazing, isn't it? It's the kind of thing that I, re I remember, I do remember just how ill I felt afterwards, <laughs> but I would do it again. Yeah. I wouldn't even hesitate. I yeah. would do it again, even though I know that I'm going to feel like that because it's such an amazing thing to be able to do. But you, in your career, you've seen a lot of change mm. in the Royal Air Force. Um, there have been a number of challenges that you would have seen all the way through your career. And, and obviously in recent years, there have been some very specific challenges. But how would you categorize the, the service today in terms of its people, uh, its capabilities, its readiness, its operations? You know, yeah. what, what would you say about the Royal Air Force today? Wow. So where do I start? Well, let's, let's look at the, the capability that we've got. Um, over the last 10, 15 years or so, the Air Force has enjoyed a remarkable level of investment, we call it recapitalization. Pretty much everything that we operate is relatively new, kind of been in service for 10 years or, or, or less. And the fact that those aircraft I worked on in my early career are in museums is kind of indicative of that change. So, so the, the Air Force that we've got today is the most modern it's been in terms of kit and capability throughout my career operating F-35, Typhoon, Voyager, A-400, all of these things are really at the leading edge of, of capability and technology. And uh, actually that, that investment is coming to an end. So pretty much the, the Air Force that we've got today is the Air Force we're going to have for the next five or ten years. On the horizon is Future Combat Air System or the Global Combat Air Programme with, with Italy and Japan. And that, I mean that's hugely exciting and that, that will be a a program that excites people um, who, in their teens or younger, about the future in, in, in aerospace and in the Air Force more generally. But so, from a capability perspective, we are really very fortunate in what what we now have in service and the capability that brings to to the front line. But what that means is, because we're coming to the end of that period of investment, what we've got to do is make sure that we continue to evolve and develop that capability. And technology is around us has moved at a phenomenal pace over the last 20 years. And one of our real, ch real challenges as an Air Force is how do we extract the kind of value from that technology, much of which is now being invented in the private sector rather than in the, the laboratories of, of big defence uh, companies or government laboratories in, in Western Europe and North America. And how do we extract that the, 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 the benefits from artificial intelligence, the benefits from digital tools, the benefits from miniaturization, and, it, and integrate those rapidly into our own capability. And so we continue to evolve and develop because our enemies and potential adversaries are doing that and they are changing. So it's really incumbent on us to create a, an air force that is able to integrate that technology rapidly and quickly. And, and I remain very proud of the people that we are still able to, to recruit into the Air Force. There's some real headwinds at the moment in terms of recruitment, uh, with lots of job vacancies in the UK, wages rising. But actually the Air Force, certainly in comparison with the Army and Navy, continues to do well in its recruitment. We've got to keep hold of those people that join as well through making sure that we look after them with good infrastructure, with good terms and conditions of service. But the quality of the people we have and the training that we have remains really world class and first class. And as long as we have that and those people, I think my, I'm optimistic about our ability to, to seize the opportunity of new technology and to, to adapt. We can draw a lot of lessons perhaps from the war in Ukraine and Russia's invasion um, and the kind of bloody battle that we're seeing in the east of the country. But it's pretty clear to me that air power and air superiority are fundamental to success and the fact that neither side has really been able to been able to either gain or sustain air superiority is part of the reason that we're seeing the, the kind of bloody attritional battles that we are in the east of the country. Uh, but also the, the side that's able to adapt the fastest, I and mean, this is a lesson from all history of warfare, the side that's able to adapt fastest will, will prevail. And so we have to be ready to do that and we have to have the kind of agility of mindset and the, the skills and education in our people, that creativity that I see whenever I go around the Air Force to actually make us adapt in terms of how we do things and what we do and the technology that, that we use. And that's really the focus that we need to have over the next few years is how we adapt what we've got to make sure that we stay ahead of our, of our potential enemies. 
So I think what I'm, what I'm hearing is that the two of the biggest challenges that the Royal Air Force has in the years to come is, number one, maintaining that uh, progress, maintaining uh, you know, that technological advancement, um, and also, number two, making sure that we've got the right people joining the, the Air Force yeah. in, in the first place and retaining those people that are already here. But you know, is that a good categorization of the two main challenges? Or? Yeah, you summed it up brilliantly. That's, that's, I think that's exactly it. It's it's how do we uh, how do we get the most out of this investment that we've made? So extract the maximum value out of that investment taxpayers made in the air force, give us the most capability. How do we adapt it quickly? So it's this rapid, continuous technology integration. And then how do we make sure that we continue to recruit and retain the people that we need to deliver that, that capability in the future? So you mentioned um, the war in Ukraine. Uh, it's obviously, uh, I guess, the best example today of just how unstable the world mm -hmm. remains. Um, we know there are other, uh, there are other areas of uh, concern elsewhere in the world as well. Uh, we know that the Royal Air Force is deployed in various mm -hmm. parts of the world. But how important is it to us today to maintain and to continue to grow and adapt that modern and very dynamic Royal Air Force for the future? When we published the integrated review back in 2021, we were really clear that there was an important role for the armed forces to play globally. It's important that we were able to project uh, power and capability to help reassure and, uh, our allies in, in various regions around the world and, and bring stability. Air power provides you with a unique ability to move rapidly and project power and force right around the globe remarkably quickly. So at the tail end of last year, we deployed typhoons out to uh, northern Australia in anything called Exercise Pitch Black, uh, which is a really great example of how you can do that with a light footprint, uh, a single Voyager, couple of uh, a single A400M plus the 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 typhoon, which is actually compared to our the other our allies that went with us, really light footprint, but it just demonstrates our ability to do that. And it seems to me that uh, air power brings that unique capability to deploy rapidly and to project power into various regions around the world. But the importance of the Air Force uh, and air and space power in protecting the country and protecting the country's interests, I think is really exposed in what's happened in, in Ukraine. It really reinforces the point that in the future we need to be ready to fight and win con for control of the air if we're going to be able to, be able to deliver effect through uh, through, through the air and integrate with, with land and maritime forces. If I look back on my career, I don't think there's ever been a time, certainly since the end of the Cold War, where we felt that threat so acutely and the Air Force really needs to be ready, to I say, to fight and win for control of the air. And that's, that's our central purpose. Everything flows from that. And you mentioned allies a lot, and obviously we're, we're working very closely with allies in a, in a number of areas. What's the, what's the strength of the relationship with our allies at the moment? And how is, how is NATO performing from an Air Force point of view? Because um, obviously NATO is an organisation that I'm sure many of us are hoping will expand uh, in, 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 not too, in the not too distant future. Um, there's lots of joint operations going on all over the place. Um, so it feels on the outside as if the strength of those relationships and actually NATO operations are working incredibly well and actually probably what we've seen in the last year or so, it's actually getting stronger uh, and there's more cooperation, there's more uh, activities and more joint deployments happening. But how would you, how would you categorise that at the moment? Yeah, I think you're right. Strategically, alliances are the thing that our foes fear. The fact that um, like-minded nations are able to, to, to link arms, lock shields if you like, um, and, and be prepared to face down aggression in the world is something that our allies, our, our allies value most and which our foes fear particularly. In terms of NATO in particular, I think the alliance has really demonstrated its strength and its unity through the last year and a bit um, since Russia invaded Ukraine and really demonstrated the importance of alliances and the value that it adds in terms of bringing stability and, and really facing down a, 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 an existential threat to 
uh, to NATO and to our allies inside NATO. And I think the health of that relationship is really strong. You see, right now we've got uh, British and German typhoons operating out of Estonia as part of NATO air policing and really demonstrating to our allies in the East that uh, we are all part of this alliance and that we will um, are prepared to put our armed forces in harm's way to protect them. And I think that's a really good indicator of the strength of that relationship and the commitment that the UK and our allies have to stability in Europe. So it's been, um, it's been a tough few years for the Royal Air Force. I don't think anybody um, would, would be able to say anything differently. I mean, there have been a number of issues um, that I know um, top brass here have been, have been dealing with, have been managing. Um, What's the, what's the plan for the future? What's your vision for the future? Because I know how passionate you are about the Royal Air Force. I also know how passionate you are about the people within the Royal Air Force. I know how, uh, how caring you are in terms of people's opportunities for development and to have, uh, really to follow in your footsteps, to have that amazing opportunity that the Royal Air Force has presented to you. Um, so what's your vision for the future? How do you see things progressing over the, over the coming years? The Air Force has come under some criticism over the last uh, year or so. Um, and, you know, I think in the Air Force we think of ourselves as competent, um, fair and, and meritocratic, and they're kind of core to it, the way we think about ourselves. And the criticisms that, that were levelled at the Air Force uh, last year kind of undermine some of those things. But fundamentally, Air Force still is highly competent, fair and, and meritocratic and hugely inclusive. Um, and we, as a service, um, have got a long history to draw on and actually a bright future ahead of us in terms of those core principles that we, that we care about. And they have, not, uh, they have not changed. I mean, in terms of the vision for the future, I think um, the Air Force, as I said, in terms of equipment and capabilities, quite well set now for the next decade or more. So the focus is really on making sure that we, we, we can make that work. It's getting the most out of that, that equipment that, that we've got. It's also about uh, exploiting technology that is emerging. As I say, it's a rapid and continuous integration of new technology into our systems to grow it and move it quickly. And I think alongside space, uh, and the Air Force is, is, uh, has Space Command under its remit, um, alongside space, I think there are three key areas of technology that are really going to affect uh, and, uh, our outlook and a way we deliver operations and add to the capability we have from these, these platforms in this investment we've made. The first of those is around un uncrewed systems or uh, robotic or, and, and automated systems. And I expect to see in the next 10-15 uh, years uh, the Air Force operating crewed aircraft alongside uncrewed aircraft, and that's how we'll improve survivability and lethality. I think we'll see increasing use of synthetics. I mean, there are some things we just can't do uh, with some of our aircraft today, like, like F-35, outside, outside of war and outside of the simulator, because it would tell our adversaries too much about those uh, techniques and processes and the, and the capability. And I think that, um, so I expect to see us uh, uh, spend more, uh, see us using synthetic devices and simulators much more to train and to prepare. There'll always be a place for life flying, uh, but increasingly that will be focused on, on, on operations. And then um, I think the third technology is digital. It's about how we exploit the amazing development of artificial intelligence to help us make sense of vast amounts of data on the battlefield and to help us make faster and better decisions and being able to outthink and outmaneuver our adversary. So I think for the future, uh, in terms of capability, it is going to be how do we make what we've got even better by the exploitation technology, use of automated systems, use of synthetics and digital. In terms of the people that we need, well, we're still going to need people to fix our aircraft, to, to, to prepare uh, uh, our logistics and supply and to do all the things that are necessary to get our aircraft in the air and deliver that air power. Um, but increasingly we're going to need to operate in a more agile fashion. We've become very heavily focused around a small number of bases. What we know is in the future we're going to, be able to, we're going to have to be able to move around. That's going to be essential for, for survival. So we're going to need people with those skills. We're going to have to relearn some of the things that we knew about in the Harrier Force in the 80s and, and the 90s. And we're going to need to 
bring in new skills into the Air Force, people who can program, people who understand some of that di digital technology, understand cyberspace and are able to uh, understand space and are able to, to make sure that we are extracting the maximum value out of the investment we've already made and exploiting, as I say, that technology that's, that's emerging. So I think the future is bright for the Air Force. And it's really interesting. I remember the um, the adverts, the recruitment adverts mm. that I've seen. Well, I'm actually thinking about it uh, even back in university days. And I think certainly in more recent years, one of the big pushes has been around the diversity of people mm. that you need to attract to join the, the Royal Air Force. And I'm sure it's the same for the other services as well. Um, and I think sometimes people do forget that it's not just about pilots. Mm. You know, and pilots are incredibly important, and you know, that is what you think about when you think about the Royal Air Force. But the Royal Air Force needs everybody. I mean, it's, it's really, it's almost a, a sort of a, a community on its yeah. own, isn't it? You have, you have lawyers, uh, yeah. you have HR people, yeah. you have communications people, yeah. you have engineers, you have mechanics, you have, you have pretty much everything here. I can't actually think of a, of a role that maybe the, the Royal Air Force wouldn't need. But, mm. So how do you go about spreading that message a little bit more and, and becoming attractive to, to, to other professions? Yeah, I, one of the things about the Air Force in my experience is, uh, over throughout my career is, is a real sense of understanding amongst our people that we are all part of the wider enterprise. It's more obvious in the Air Force than perhaps it is in the Navy or the Army because we put an airplane in the air with a pilot in it. Um, but we all see ourselves as having a role in doing that. And in the future, that's going to be even more the case, particularly as we integrated on crude systems in there. We rely he more heavily on, on, on digital and reach back, electronic warfare. And so in the future, e everybody in the Air Force is a warrior, not just the person who, who's strapped into uh, the aircraft. And I think that uh, when you look at actually our ability to recruit, um, we, we in many ways don't, don't struggle to recruit more broadly um, than just the, the pilots. We have lots and lots of people who want to be joined to be pilots and there are only so many places. Um, there is, we know there's a skill shortage in the UK around some engineering and some cyberspace skills. So we've got to be competitive. We've got to offer people um, exciting opportunities that they can't get in working for Google or for Microsoft or, or for a local, uh, local garage. And I think the Air Force still offers those things. We offer the opportunity to do things you can't do elsewhere and we offer a wider um, set of opportunities around the, the camaraderie, around the spirit of the, the, the community that, that, that we join. And as you say, some of the adverts we see today, they really focus on that and uh, demonstrating that actually these people are from all backgrounds, like mine, are fundamental to delivering air power of the future and protecting the, protecting the country. So at Aerotime, we think that we have a bit of a responsibility to spread these messages mm. with the community that loves aviation mm. and that you know, loves military aviation as much as commercial aviation. Um, and I think you've, you've probably answered this question, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Um, what would your message be to the next generation of aviators or the next mm. generation of personnel joining mm. the military, especially the, the Royal Air Force? Um, you know, there are a lot of people out there who would love to follow in your footsteps. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced of that. So what would you say, what would you say to the 16-year-old Rich <laughs> thinking about signing up for the next 16 years? What would you say to that person today? Yeah, do it. Um, so the joining the armed forces is joining a, an organisation that has a higher purpose. Our, our job is to protect the nation, protect our interests and protect our people. And that is important in life. This is important to have a purpose. And there's lots of research about uh, the, 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 the current generation of uh, teenagers coming through. Uh, I've got two daughters who are uh, 22 and 20, and they, they really care about purpose. They really care about their environment. And I think the, the, the responsibility we have in the armed forces and the Air Force in particular to protect our country, protect our people, protect our interests, remains paramount. And um, those, that, that uh, uh, sense of purpose, that, that sense of responsibility, I think remains important. But it's also a, an organisation that, that has uh, a sense of team, uh, an absolute desire to be inclusive, to attract people from the widest possible set of backgrounds 
and to, to work to a common purpose and the opportunity to work on modern technology, modern equipment, to be creative, uh, which is not always a word we associate with the armed forces, but that's exactly what, what the Air Force offers. And, and um, I have uh, loved my time in the service and uh, I've learned so many skills and made so many friends and enjoyed the things that, that I've done. I felt proud of it. I would really encourage uh, youngsters to, to consider a career in the armed forces and especially the Air Force. Uh, not that there's any competition, right? No, of, course, of course not. So, um, again, this is going to be a very unfair question to ask you, but uh, in your time in the Royal Air Force, you would have experienced so many yeah, amazing things, and you, you've alluded to that. But if I had to ask you, you know, if there was one particular experience or one particular moment, one particular sort of favourite aviation-related or Royal Air Force-related moment that you would you know, really pick on, to say, you know what, either that was the day that my life changed, or that was the day that I always remember, or you know what, flying at Max 17 was amazing, or whatever it might be. What would what would be the thing you'd pick out? I'm I'm going to pick three things. Okay. Uh, so if if it's if it's purely aviation related, going faster than the speed of sound over the North Sea in a typhoon, albeit entirely unremarkable, was definitely a, a, a stat. I think the performance takeoff in an F-15 out of RAF Lake and Heath, that was particularly special moment as we went vertical uh, and levelled out at 10,000 feet. That was really quite quite cool. But the, the things that I look back on and I tell stories about are about the people that I've been involved with and I've met in, in the Air Force. And those, those moments as a, as a young leader or even as older as a station commander, where you see people do things they didn't know they could do, where they did things that where they where they um, achieved the unexpected. Those are really special moments when you think you're part of that, and you're part of the team that allowed that allowed people to do things that they never thought they would be able to do. Those are really special moments, and those are the things that I cherish and I I, I tell stories about. It's about the people uh, that I've worked with. I mean, I can totally relate to that because uh, every experience I've had with people, all personnel across the Royal Air Force has always been, you know, great. You feel incredibly uh, welcomed. You mm. feel uh, incredibly well looked after. You feel uh, as if people are incredibly passionate about the job that they have and about you know, telling people mm. about the job they have and wanting to really, you know, promote the Royal Air Force. So I can totally relate to that. But the, I'm going to pick you up on one thing, though. Uh, uh, the F-35 going vertical, really, really cool. Where does terrifying fit into that? Because I would be going with terrifying rather. I mean, it, cool, I totally agree, but terrifying, oh, where, where does that balance come? So I've always had this view that if it was dangerous, they wouldn't ask you to do it. <laughs> so, uh, no, I, it's not, I, no, I've never been uh, frightened in that way. I felt quite sick in the back yeah, of it. Yeah, I can imagine. But, uh, yeah. No, I've yeah. never, never been terrified, actually. Um, and I, uh, maybe I am a bit of a thrill seeker. Maybe yeah, I enjoy yeah. uh, enjoy testing the boundaries uh, a, a wee bit. But mm -hmm. no, no, never terrified. Well, I'm glad we're sitting here doing this rather than somewhere like Alton Towers because I would be <laughs> worried about what was coming next. Okay, last question for you. Very important question for Aerotime viewers. Mm. What is your favourite aircraft? <sighs> That's a Tough tricky one. question. <laughs> so I think from history, mm -hmm. be the Mosquito. Right. Okay. I just think that the the way in which it was designed, the, the exceptional performance it had for its particular role is just incredible. It's a, a real matter of sadness to me that we haven't got any flying mosquitoes at the moment, although I understand there may be one mm -hmm. being rebuilt. Um, but if I had to choose something that has been in service while I've been in my, in my career, I think I'd have to choose the Harrier. Right, right. I, and, and again, I, I'm, I'm not at all surprised and I couldn't disagree with you. Uh, in fact, the other day we visited the Gatwick Aviation Museum mm. and I got to sit in, in, a, in a Lightning. Oh, wow. That was parked up alongside a uh, Harrier, actually. So for me, that was a bit of a dream come true, just yeah. sitting there and uh, looking out. So that was incredible. So look, Sir Rich, thank you so much for your you. time today. Um, thank you for your dedication to the Royal Air Force. Uh, I'm sure there's many people here who would want to uh, pass on their thanks for that because I know how dedicated you are to this. Um, good luck in the future. We Thank look forward to following the rest of your career uh, you. and all of your thrill-seeking, whenever that <laughs> might come. Uh, but for today, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Cheers. It's been a great pleasure. Thanks, Richard.